Welcome back friends. In this session, I am going to talk about epidural anesthesia. Epidural anesthesia, as you all know, is very important form of anesthesia. This has been rapidly developed, developing form of anesthesia and it is used very rampantly in case of pain management, in case of labor analgesia. I am going to talk in detail about epidural anesthesia, the actual procedure, what is the, what are the drugs used for giving epidural anesthesia, what are the complications, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the same. Now coming to epidural anesthesia, it is used for relief of pain during and or after the surgery. So this is the most important form of anesthesia. It can be used as an adjuvant to general anesthesia. It can be used in combination with spinal anesthesia or it can be used for purely pain management purposes. It can be used as pa patient controlled analgesia post operatively. It can be used in labor analgesia. It can be used for hypotensive anesthesia which is, which uh, in some cases, in some surgeries, hypotensive anesthesia is a must. For example, surgeries involving upper, upper abdomen where my, my minute vascular surgeries have to be done. Surgeon always asks anesthetists to give a very hypotensive anesthesia and in this case, epidural anesthesia forms a major part. It is It can also be used to supplement general anesthesia, just as I said. Coming to epidural anesthesia, site of action where actually this epidural anesthesia works. It acts on the nerve roots of extradural space. Say brain is covered by three matters that dura matter, arachnoid and pia matter. This form of anesthesia that is epidural anesthesia it is given in epidural space or extradural space. Once the drug is injected in the extradural space it acts on the nerve roots of the extradural space and it is from here that action or epidural anesthesia action starts. It also acts on nerve roots of paravertebral spaces because they are easily approachable by this particular drug. So this, uh, this is another mechanism by which epidural anesthesia acts. The other way is it acts on the nerve roots of subarachnoid space and can also act by diffusion into subperineal and subpile spaces. So epidural anesthesia, the site of action, it can be divided into four types. It can act on nerve roots of extradural space. It can act on nerve root of paravertebral space. It can act on nerve roots of subarachnoid space. And it can also act by diffusing into the subperineal and subpile spaces. Now what are the fibers blocked? Just as I have described in case of spinal anesthesia, similarly in epidural anesthesia, following are the fi fibers blocked after giving epidural anesthesia. Anterior nerve roots, posterior nerve roots and, ga of, and ga ganglions, mixed spinal nerves, white and grey rami communications, visceral afferent sympathetics and descending pathways in the cord. So the fibers which are blocked in case of epidural anesthesia are, this is very important from MCQ point of view. So please have a look on your screen. The following fibers are blocked after giving epidural anesthesia, that is anterior nerve roots, posterior nerve roots and ganglia, mixed spinal nerves, white and grey rami communicates, visceral afferent sympathetics, descending pathways in cord. Now, the actual procedure of giving epidural anesthesia, it starts by your preoperative visit, which is the same as you do in your spinal anesthesia or giving general anesthesia. What are the goals of preoperative visit? First and foremost is to allay the anxiety of the patient. The patient may be anxious to undergo surgery and he may be anxious what form of anesthesia is going to be administered, at what level it is going to be administered, for how long patient is going to be sedated or unconscious and after how long patient is going to regain his consciousness. So these forms of this form, various form of questions are always present in the mind of the patient just a day prior or two days prior to the surgery. So it is always important on the anesthetist point of view to allay this fear, go and visit the patient preoperatively, just allay all his anxiety, talk with him, explain the procedure to him, how and explain your plan of action, listen to him, give him your ear, just listen to all his fears and try to communicate with him so that you can relieve him with all his fears because if a patient is stable without any anxiety, half of your job is done before surgery itself. 
So mild sedative should be given to patient previous night just as in case of spinal anesthesia. Explain the procedure just as I mentioned to the patient in his own language. Allay his fear, get to know his pro problems, get to know his uh, doubts and clear those doubts in his own language. Written informed consent as I already mentioned in my previous module and in pre-operative module, pre-operative visit module. It is very important in this world, in the medical, from medical legal point of view, to get a written informed consent in front of two or three witnesses after explaining complete procedure to the patient in his own language. Then hydration should be done just as in case of spinal anesthesia with IV fluids. Then this is followed by IV line cannulated, a proper big IV line is cannulated, patient is well hydrated before the procedure. These are the preoperative things should, that should be done before giving epidural anesthesia. Now the procedure. Procedure again, there are two types of approaches, midline approach, parallel midline approach. Talking about midline approach, patient is in sitting position. Patient should be made sit, uh, made to sit on the operation table with nurse or attendant sup supporting his back. His neck should be flexed and back should be relaxed as much as possible. To his needle is selected. There are two types of to his needles that is 16 number and 18 number depending on the size of patient. You judge the number of needle, uh, the number of the needle or the diameter of the needle which is needed. To his needle is selected either 16 or 18 gauge. Full flexion of the spine is employed with the help of attendant. Space is selected as per the site and duration of surgery. Now this is very important. Epi while employing epidural anesthesia as in spinal anesthesia, you are always supposed to give it at either at the level of L4, L5 or L3, L4 level. But in case of epidural anesthesia, you can administer epidural anesthesia at any level depending on the site of the surgery, depending on the size and duration of the surgery because you can, you can put in the epidural catheter at any space even at the thoracic level though it is very difficult to put epidural catheter at the thoracic level and its complications are different but the difference between epidural and spinal anesthesia is epidural anesthesia can be given at any of the interspace right from thorax up to the lumbar region. The space selected as per the, just as I said, space is selected as per the site and duration of surgery. Mostly L2, L3 space is selected. I mean routinely L2, L3 space is selected. And then the procedure is started. Will is made as in case of spinal anesthesia in the midline of the space with the help of local anesthesia. Then the procedure needle is inserted perpendicular to the back. This is very important to his needle is inserted perpendicular to the back slowly till ligamentum flavum is approached. Ligamentum flavum is the, is the line from where extradural space or epidural space starts. Suddenly, once the ligamentum flavum is pierced, there is loss of resistance, which is very well experienced by an experienced hand. Alternatively, if the anesthetist is new one or is not as experienced, a syringe is employed and with the help of syringe, you attach the syringe to the to his needle and slowly enter the spine and slowly enter the interspinal space. At a particular point, when you pierce the ligamentum flavum, the air which is present in the syringe, you, they, you, you appreciate the giveaway. This is the epidural space. This syringe employed, you, with the help of syringe employed, you can appreciate this loss of resistance. So again I talk, again I will tell you, how do you know you are in extraordinary space? There is suddenly lack of resistance as it leaves ligamentum, ease of injection of air or liquid once you are in extraordinary space, withdrawal or hanging drop method of saline. Once you withdraw the syringe, the, the drop which uh, the, if a syringe contains, you contain a uh, now I, can, I will explain to you in detail of each each one of them how actually you know you are in extradural space. Say for example, you start uh, you insert a T to his needle with the help of uh, with the help of a syringe. Syringe is completely uh, completely empty. You take air two or three cc of air and with the help of air start pushing the air slowly as you enter the interspinal space. Once you pierce the ligamentum flavor suddenly there will be loss of resistance and uh, you will be able to uh, press or push the air completely in the, this is the extradural space. This is how you 
you appreciate loss of resistance. This can also be done with the help of fluid. Instead of taking air in the syringe, you can always take distilled water in the syringe or NS in the syringe and employ the same method. At the same space, you will be able to push the liquid or distilled water or, a, or NS which you have taken in syringe very freely and that space is extradural space. Also, the other method of localizing uh, epidural space is through ultrasonographic guided, USG guided localization which can be done, done, which is done routinely nowadays in higher centers. Procedure, now injection must commence only when you are in the space. You should be 100% sure that you are in the epidural space by loss of resistance technique with the help of air or pushing of uh, distilled water or NS in the epidural space by the other method. If after employing both the methods you are 100% sure that you are in the epidural space then and then only injection must commence. A small test dose must be given to check you are not in the subarachnoid space because it is very easy to appreciate loss of resistance as you appreciate in case of subarachnoid, uh, subarachnoid block. But the difference between subarachnoid block and an epidural block, once you enter the subarachnoid space, there will be free flow of cerebrospinal fluid. But in case of epidural space, there will be no free flow of any of the fluid. On the contrary, there will be loss of resistance and the amount of liquid which you, uh, amount of water, distilled water or NS which you push easily grows in the epidural space. So this is how you differentiate between subarachnoid space and epidural space. Once you are in subarachnoid space, there will be free flow of CSF because CSF is present only in subarachnoid space and not in epidural space. This is very important from exam point of view. Small test dose is given to test the subarachnoid block. As I said, if subarachnoid block does not occur in 5 minutes, and how do you judge that whether the subarachnoid block is not, uh, not occurred, inability to move the feet, tachycardia and uh, uh, sensory and motor block of lower limbs. Because as soon as you inject the drug in subarachnoid space, immediately subarachnoid block ensues as in case of spinal anesthesia. But once you are sure that you are not in subarachnoid space, there is no chance that subarachnoid block can occur. And in case of epidural anesthesia, even if you inject the drug, it takes small amount of time, say 5 to 10 minutes for, for the block to develop. Now, if just as I mentioned, if subarachnoid block does not occur in 5 minutes, that is inability to move the feet and tachycardia, then full dose is given. The other complication is if dura is pierced, that is instead of, uh, instead of being present in the epidural space, if you are in the dura, I mean you pierce the dura matter. What, what, what should be the action? Immediately withdraw the needle. Another attempt is made once one space higher than what it was or you convert this into subarachnoid block or the best option in this case is abandon the procedure. Because once you pierce the dura, even if you try to enter one space higher, it may be possible to enter one space higher only with experienced hand. But in, in case of inexperienced hands, it may not be possible because there are high chances that you may again pierce the dura. In such case, it is abandon the procedure, then ask, employ another technique, probably a general anesthesia for this particular patient. So keep this in mind, if dura is punctured while giving epidural anesthesia, another attempt should be made, one space higher to the epidural space, which has, has already been employed, or else convert this epidural block into subarachnoid block by piercing the subarachnoid, by, by entering the subarachnoid space or else abandon the procedure that is the safest of the all. Then as I explained this single shot epidural procedure which I just explained talking about continuous epidural anesthesia. If surgery is of long duration then epidural catheter is placed instead of single dose. The procedure which I explained was single dose or single shot epidural anesthesia. Now if surgery is of long duration say total cholecystectomy or Whipple's operation to be done on abdomen. In these cases, continuous epidural anesthesia has to be employed. So in such cases, what you do, the procedure is same. Once you appreciate the loss of resistance technique, you insert an epidural catheter instead of a single dose. The catheter is inserted through the needle with tip in upward direction. Water and saline, 
water saline is injected in the needle to facilitate the movement. That is, once you are sure that you are in the epidural space, hold the needle in the same position, insert one or two cc of water inside the to his needle and now start slowly pushing the epidural catheter either 16 or 18 gauge through the needle slowly till it enters till it passes the twist needle and enters the subarachnoid space catheter is placed three to four segments above the space fix the anesthetic solution catheter is catheter is placed three to four segments above the space and fixed anesthetic solution can then be administered as and when required before administrating, administering this anesthetic solution through the catheter, it is always important to aspirate and check whether catheter is in properly placed and whether any CSF flow is present in the catheter. Only when the, there is no CSF cerebrospinal fluid flow through the catheter, then and then only drug has to be injected. While fixing the catheter, it is always important that you fix the catheter at a specific point and you should know and label the catheter so that even if you are not there, there some other anesthetist is going to give that particular drug through the epidural catheter, he should have idea that catheter is how many segments above the space through which it has been inserted. What is the uses of epidural and continuous epidural anesthesia? It is useful when extent of surgery is uncertain. That is you did not know surgeon, even surgeon does not know how much time the surgery is going to take. So, it is always important to maintain the anesthesia throughout the length of the surgery. In that case, continuous epidural anesthesia is a very important tool because whenever the action wanes off of the epidural anesthesia, you can always inject some amount of drug to the, through the catheter present or through the catheter which you have inserted and fixed. Some amount of drug you can in inject again and again, time and time again till the surgery is over and this is how continuous epidural anesthesia is given. Second form, second use is when time of commencement is uncertain. Sometimes in some cases time of commencement of surgery is very uncertain. Say for example patient is in uh, unconscious state or traumatic patients and there are a lot of surgeries to be done. The patient is already being operated for some other surgery and is going to be operated next for some other surgery. Same patient is being operated but the time or schedule of surgery is uncertain. In these cases, continuous epidural anesthesia can come as very handy in such cases. Handicap patients, it can be, be very handy. And patient control analgesia, this is, a, this is a newer concept like patient control pain management. Continuous epidural, uh, epidural catheter is placed in the epidural space. It is fixed and thorough, th thoroughly fixed and checked. And patient himself has the edge of the uh, epidural catheter Whenever patient feels pain, he is given the drug, he himself injects the drug. This is called patient controlled analgesia, which is going on the newer concept. It is very rapidly used and rampantly used in Western countries and it, has, it can be formed as mainstay in pain management. So for that, continuous epidural anesthesia is a yardstick. Now assessment of successful block, how do you assess whether after giving Epidural anesthesia, it has, it has been epidural anesthesia is successful or unsuccessful. Following are the points which you, which you should always note. There will be disappearance of anal tone. This suggests that block is at the level of S4, S5. Disappearance of knee jerks. This suggests that block is at the level of L2, L4. Disappearance of ankle jerk. This suggests that block is at the level of S1, S2. Disappearance of abdominal muscle tone. This suggests that block it as the level of T8 to L1. Skin analgesia tested with the help of pin pricks and absence of movements of hips and knee, knees joint. Doses. Now it is very important to know the doses of epidural anesthesia because various forms of drugs have been used and employed giving epidural anesthesia and they have achieved the goal in various proportions. But I am going to talk only of standard drugs which have been used because many theses have been done by many students in many colleges employing various other drugs, uh, various concentrations and various volumes. But I am going to talk only about the standard protocol which I have been taught. I normally use 1.5% xylocaine and uh, for various operations, for various surgeries, the amount or volume of the drug differs. 
say for example in suprapubic prostate uh, prostatectomy i use around 10 to 20 ml of 1.5% xylocaine similarly for case of vaginal or perineal repair i use around 20 to 35 ml of the same drug for use for hernia or appendicectomy i use around 20 to 30 ml of 1.5% lignocaine and for around upper abdominal surgeries i use around 35 to 40 ml of 1.5% xylocaine and for LSAS or lower segment caesarean section, I use around 15 to 20 ml of 1.5% xylocaine solution. Sometimes I always, sometimes I prefer to use 0.5% sensorcaine, 0.5% bupivacaine instead of using xylocaine. And that I use 20 ml needed to be given with care. 20 ml of solution I use very slowly with care carefully to be given in case of epidural anesthesia for up lower abdominal surgeries. Vipivacan which is popularly used are around 0.25% to 0.375% as they increase the volume. Once you increase the volume, the number of segments which you block increase. So doses, again I say I prefer 1.5% xylocaine for various surgeries as I mentioned. 0.5% bupivacan is used in various volumes, in various forms. but 0.25% to 0.375% of bupivacan is rapidly used and is used rampantly because it tends to increase the volume of the drug. So the indications for upper and indications for using epidural anesthesia just as I said upper abdominal surgeries, lower abdominal surgeries, vertebral column operations, obstetric analgesia, post-operative pain relief, long orthopedic surgeries and as an adjuvant to general anesthesia. What are the complications? Complications are just as I have already mentioned inadequate block. This could, this could be easily treated by injecting some more amount of drug through the catheter which you have already fixed. Hypotension, this can be countered by using IV fluids, IV pressure drugs, IV atropine. Hypoapnea, if at all the, the, the level of blockade is at higher level hypopnea or decrease in the respiratory rate can occur nausea and vomiting is a com common complication which can be treated with antacids and antiemetics total spinal anesthesia sometimes if you do not check the flow of csf or do not check the uh, whether you are really in epidural space total spinal anesthesia can occur if without checking the flow of csf you, you inject the drug but total spinal anesthesia as i already talked with you in another module it is very very easy to uh, treat you have to intubate the patient and ventilate till the action wears off. Prolonged analgesia is one of the complications. Actually, it is not a complication. It is for, it is like a boon for the patient. Horner syndrome may be a complication. Higher block, depending on the level where you inject the drug, block could be high or low. Trigeminal nerve palsy, it, also is, it is also a possibility. What are the advantages over general anesthesia? Protection from the stress response. Patient is breathing spontaneously, thus spontaneous respiration is maintained. So undue complication of controlled ventilation are avoided. Analgesia, relaxation, ischemia and contracted bowels. There is proper analgesia to the patient. There is proper relaxation and bowels which are, which are supposed to be contracted, which is needed for surgeons can be achieved by this particular form of anesthesia. It is also suitable in asthmatics, in bronchitis and in emphysema. Patients with allergy to muscle relaxant can be used. These are the advantages of epidural anesthesia over general anesthesia. What are the contraindications? Severe shock if not properly prehydrated. Patient factors like obesity, kyphoscoliosis, severe asthma, neurological, uh, neurological patients, unconscious patients, clotting factors, skin sepsis in lumbar region. These are the contraindications which are the same. Which, are you, which I have already mentioned during spinal anesthesia. Thus, epidural anesthesia form as an adjuvant. It has some advantages, but it has some disadvantages also. What are the disadvantages? Difficulty in being sure at the needle point. So, only with the experience hand you know whether you are in the epidural space or you are in the subarachnoid space. Time taken for the block. It, is, it takes around 5 to 7 or 5 to 10 minutes for the block to properly develop. This is time taken as in contrast to spinal anesthesia where block occurs just as, as soon as you give the drug. And time taken for onset. Onset of action takes around 10 to 15 minutes. So these are the disadvantages of epidural anesthesia. Overall, thinking and talking in terms of epidural anesthesia, 
it is as an adjuvant to GA is it is better than GA or better than general anesthesia because it avoids the stress response and the most important thing is patient is breathing on his own and all the stress response of general anesthesia can be avoided plus, plus patient gets patient controlled analgesia with the help of catheter as and when required he can control his own pain so he is master of his own pain thank you very much